And now, live from Level 5 Productions on the island of Milleronia, it's The Larry Miller Show! Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. America, and everyone who really wants to have a great dinner with their kids. Hi, folks, and welcome back to The Larry Miller Show. I'm Larry Miller, but in a way, aren't we all? And boy, oh boy, was it ever a beautiful day today on the mainland, which is where I am, of course, with Colonel Jeff. And uh, I'm on the mainland for a reason. I'll tell you soon. Well, another minute, I think 1.6 minutes, something like that. But in any case, we're here. It's just beautiful today. And as you know, as always, boy, the music makes me feel great. And uh, Colonel Jeff, too, it's a great way to start the show. And I hope you like it, too. Of course, that's the Tim Conway Orchestra and the Sonia Klimek. Ugh. That's the... S- <laughs> That's the Tim Conway Orchestra and the Sonia Klimek Dancers, featuring boy tenor Brad Simpson asking the musical question, Since there are no drinking holidays in America, is there such a day on Milleronia? And if so, is it called St. Geminis Day? Well, heck of a question, uh, Brad. And by the way, let me just tell you and explain that uh, Brad picking that name as wonderful because on uh, the Larry Miller Drinking Society cards, uh, it has, uh, well, coming out of my life, the real uh, living of, on the road. When you're on the road and you're doing a bunch of shows, and I would, on the night the show was closing in town, where at whatever hotel I was staying at, which was, of course, the best, but <laughs> wherever I was, I would get back to the hotel and wash up, take my suit off, and uh, put on some comfy clothes and go back downstairs to the bar with whatever book I had brought with me. And it was, of course, late there, but there was always going to be 40 minutes left to have a drink and read a little bit in the bar. And I really liked that, and I really looked forward to it, and I would always order a double. And I'm telling you, I don't recall any time when... They gave me what I would call, in any hotel, when they gave me what I would call a double. What you would call a double. Which is, well, the kind of drink a fellow likes to pick up. And I, you know, it's not something, uh, you know, where it's, 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 it's a stuck serving where it's only a certain amount. And it just, you look at it on just a couple of cubes of ice and you think, no, why do I have to do this? They, they, they can't do better than this. And, I always wanted to say, you know, hey, excuse me, do you call this a double? And that was a little, well, a little tart, a little annoying, and I was capable of it, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it's it's late. I'm there. I just came around to the bar. I had two or three terrific shows that I was very happy with. And the next day, I would be leaving that hotel for parts unknown. And, well... I had my book with me, and I I wanted a drink, maybe two, but I wanted a drink that you could call a drink, and that's why when uh, well when Colonel Jeff and I started putting our show together and wanting to set up the well the Larry Miller Drinking Society, I wanted to have that. I thought that was a great thing. Of uh, hey, you call this a double? And because we wanted it to be a little, well, a little more elegant, a little classy, we decided to say that in Latin. And I went on the air for our next show and told everyone, you told all the folks listening, all the fans, that, uh, hey, somebody out there must be a good student of Latin and speaks it and knows it and knows how to write everything. So would you please send us, how do you say, you call that a double in Latin? And uh, we picked, we got a number of them because, and they were all different because apparently there's no, well, 2,000 years ago, there's no, there was no word for 
a double. You know, the, not the slang word we might use, whether we're on the road or not. But I mean, uh, that was, so the one we picked was a great one. Nominum quid geminus, which is, well, Latin for, you call that a double? And uh, so that's what Brad meant by saying that. He's, the question was, since there are no drinking holidays in America, is there such a day on Milleronia? And if so, is it called St. Geminus Day? Heck of a question. And uh, see, by the way, to let you know, Brad, and everyone out there, there are three big holidays on Milleronia. Spring Blossom Day for Larry, where all the beautiful young women get to walk by me on my throne in a line and kiss my hand. There's a winter festival day for Larry, where all the beautiful young women get to walk by me on my throne and kiss my other hand. And yes, Brad, we have our one big drinking holiday, and you guessed it, St. Geminus Day for Larry, where, <laughs> take a guess, yes, all the beautiful young women get to walk by me on my throne walking like Groucho, bent over with a cigar. Now, you may wonder, well, why? Why Why that? Well, I had each of my hands kissed on the end of holidays, and I love Groucho, so why not? Why the heck not, folks? Anyway, Brad, good question. Since there are no drinking holidays in America, is there such a day on Milleronia? And if, it's, if so, is it called St. Geminis Day? Yes, there is, Brad. And yes, it is called St. Geminis Day for Larry. And uh, it's worth mentioning, to say the least, there are uh, thoughts after life, uh, obituaries for, well, Tim Conway, uh, whom I haven't mentioned yet. And uh, boy, oh boy, it's talk about someone worth tipping a hat to. Uh, a terrific talent and performer. My first contact with him was as uh, Ensign, Ensign Parker on McHale's Navy. And he was pretty terrific on that. They all were. That's, it was a very good show led by the great Ernest Borgnine. And uh, anyway, Tim Conway, as you know, of course, at this point, has passed away and did so much great work. And this is a tip of the hat to him. And today we lost... Dr. John, the great Dr. John. And the word great has never been better used. Uh, this guy was a terrific composer, singer, musician. And someone, when you saw him turn to the audience there with the microphone at the piano and start to sing, wow, he could, as they say, light up a room just by being himself, just by being Dr. John. So rest in peace, pal. And there are two anniversaries I wanted to mention today. Today, well, two days ago, to be exact, was the 78th anniversary of the great Lou Gehrig, who died, well, 78 years ago, on, uh, and by the way, that was in 1941. It's a long time ago, but God bless him. What a fella he was, and I'll bet still is. And so today is also the anniversary of something else, the passing of the 19th Amendment, which, well, is very important, pretty good. It's That's the amendment that gave women the right to vote. And, well... That's certainly worth something saying about on the Larry Miller Show. And by Amazon. That's right, Amazon, the great company, Amazon. Amazon that, well, you can get everything you want in the world from Amazon, except, of course, an actual Amazon. You can't do that if the doorbell ever rings and you say hello and you open the door and it's, well, a big, tall, six-foot-four-inch muscular, gorgeous woman, what you do, you, there's one thing to do, and you should do it immediately. Call us. Call Colonel Jeff and me here at the show and say, I got an Amazon. I got an actual Amazon. 
and we'll come over, we'll introduce ourselves, certainly, and uh, it'll seem like we're pushing you out of the way, but it's not that. It uh, it may feel that way and when we kind of just bowl past you, but we're going to take the, we'll take the Amazon, introduce ourselves, take our caps off with a big smile on each of our faces, and we'll put her in the car, the big fancy car and limousine we brought just for her, and uh, and then we'll, well, we'll get to know her and check her out and have her examined, make sure everything's okay. And in any case, Amazon's a terrific group, and you really can get anything in the world there. And what you do is to get there, you know, go, to, sure, you can get there on your computer, your iPhone, whatever the heck you have. You can get right to Amazon, but don't bother with that. Don't don't work your way into a, into, into a froth just trying to get there. We'll get you there. Go to our website, LarryMillerPodcast.com. Who's on the mountain? Tom Mix. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I think I'm laughing at myself there. That was me doing that. And a good idea of Colonel Jeffs and another why the heck not, folks. So <laughs> what to do is go to our website. We have a banner there that says Amazon. Click our banner. Don't worry about a thing. Click the banner and then go take a nap. You know, put yourself back on your lazy boy chair. And you don't even need to make a big sandwich and a, and put a couple of cold beers next to you on the little table in the den. Just just put your head back, tick, tip your whole self back, and take a nap. And we'll we'll get you to Amazon. In any case, we like them a lot, and we're glad they like us. And uh, you know what? That brings me to my favorite part of the show, the joke of the week. This is a good one. It made uh, both me and the colonel laugh. And, well, I hope you like it, too. An Englishman is strolling, and he's in Wales visiting, and he walks past, well, a, a little farm, a private farm, and he sees a fellow out there, a Welshman. So he strolls right onto the farm, walks up to the Welshman and says, uh, well, you've got a nice place here. Uh, is that your dog? Yes, it is. And uh, may I talk to him? And uh, the Welshman says, dog, don't talk. And the Englishman says, all right. And he says, he just turns to the dog and says, uh, well, how are you doing? And the dog immediately says, pretty good, thanks. And the Welshman almost flips out. The dog spoke. And then the Englishman says to him, is this your owner here? And the dog says, yep. And the Englishman says, how's it uh, living with him? Is he all right? And the and dog says, yeah, it's pretty good here. He walks me twice a day and uh, feeds me good food. It gives me the run of the place, and I get to sleep on the couch. It's uh, it's actually pretty good. And uh, the guy says, all right, we'll have a good day. And then the Englishman strolls over and sees a horse there and says to the Welshman, is that your horse? And Welshman is just still shocked and says, yup. And the Englishman says, may I talk to him? And the Welshman says, horse, don't talk. And the Englishman nods and turns to the horse and says, uh, how are you doing today? And the horse says, good, good, pretty good. It's a good day so far. And the Welshman again just f f almost flips out. He can't believe this. And the Englishman says to the horse, and that's your owner? Yep. Oh, and uh, is he, uh, how is he to live with? And the horse says, pretty good. He's, uh, you know, he brushes me and, uh, and bathes me and really he gives me a nice uh, place in the stable there to sleep and relax. And uh, pff, also good food, yeah. So I've got to say, it's uh, he's all right. He's pretty good. And the Englishman smiles and uh, and just strolls along a little and sees a sheep there and uh, says to the Welshman, you mind if I talk to the sheep? And the Welshman says, anything that sheep says is a bloody lie. <laughs> we got a kick out of that. Everything else amazes him, but just, hey, suddenly he's, not kidding around with the sheep. <laughs> In any case, as always, I hope you like that one. We both do here, and, well, keep it going. 
keeping a good joke alive. Tell it to your friends and your family and your loved ones. And keeping a good joke alive is like keeping good music alive. So do that with a good joke. And that brings me to my second favorite part of the show. The Poetry Corner. Nothing more beautiful than a good string quartet like that. And this is a fine poem by a great woman, Emily Dickinson. Uh, Lived from 1830 to 1886 and born and raised where I went to school in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, she was thought of in Amherst, by the way, as a bit of an eccentric, uh, very private woman and liked to wear white clothing. It doesn't sound so nuts to me, but who knows? And uh, less than a dozen of her poems were published during her lifetime. That's interesting because, in fact, she wrote almost 1,800 poems in her whole life. Most were found by her sister after her death, and the sister worked hard to get them all published, like this one. It's called Nature. The Gentlest Mother by Emily Dickinson Nature, the gentlest mother, impatient of no child, the feeblest or the waywardest, her admonition mild. In forest and the hill, by traveler is heard, restraining rampant squirrel or too impetuous bird. How fair her conversation! A summer afternoon, her household, her assembly, and when the sun goes down, her voice among the aisles incites the timid prayer of the minutest cricket, the most unworthy flower. When all the children sleep, she turns as long away as will suffice to light her lamps, then bending from the sky with infinite affection and infiniter care, her golden finger on her lip wills silence everywhere. Isn't that lovely? Uh, Emily, you know what? You can wear all the white you want, and I bet you're wearing it now. Nature the Gentlest Mother by Emily Dickinson. And that brings me to my third favorite part of the show. M.M.M. The Magic Movie Moment. And this is a great movie, folks. And it's made from a great book. This movie, well, the book was by John Steinbeck. And it's called The Grapes of Wrath. Film made in 1940. What a group that made this. Produced by Daryl F. Zanuck. Directed by John Ford. Starring Henry Fonda, Jane Darwell, John Carradine, Ward Bond, Charlie Grapewin. So many others. A great cast in this. And what a wonderful movie. It's, oh, folks. And the magic movie moment for me, which was difficult with this movie because... There are so many in it. The scene that moves me so much every time I've seen it with all the Joad family has gone through. It's near the end of the movie and it's kind of a climax in a way. Tom, Tom Joad, Henry Fonda, is going to leave the camp and is going to have to run away because the authorities are after him. And some things he did, some things he didn't do, but it doesn't matter. He's about to go, and it's almost dawn, and his mother, Jane Darwell, what a great cast. His mother says to him, they're in a in a camp where they've been living, and, uh, and she says, but how am I going to know, Tommy? How am I going to know you're all right? How, how am I going to know what you're doing? And Fonda, as Tom Jode says, I'll be all around in the dark. I'll be everywhere, wherever you can look, wherever there's a fight so hungry people can eat. I'll be there. 
Whenever there's a cop beating up a guy, I'll be there. I'll be in the way guys yell when they're mad. I'll be in the way kids laugh when they're hungry and they know supper's ready. And when the people are eating the stuff they raise and living in the houses they build, I'll be there too. It's a great moment. It's a great scene. And by the way, it's worth putting in now. In the very last scene, as, well, Ma and Pa Jode are in the front of that old truck, and they're being driven away too, and uh, Jane says to him, I ain't never going to be scared no more. I was, though. For a while it looked as though we was beat, good and beat. Looked like we didn't have nobody in the whole world but enemies. Like nobody was friendly no more. Made me feel kind of bad and scared, too. Like we was lost and nobody cared. Rich fellas come up and they die and their kids ain't no good and they die out. But we keep a-coming. We're the people that live. They can't wipe us out. They can't lick us. We'll go on forever, Pa, because we're the people. It's a great moment at the end there. And that's how well this is all written anyway. It's great, folks. If you haven't seen it before, see it, and you'll be glad you did. The Grapes of Wrath. And read the book, too. By golly. It's all just terrific. But you know what? That's why, you know what? The big theme of that movie is family, the family, the Jode family. They never really in the movie, if you think about it, if you've seen it, they never really show what they grew in Oklahoma. It's not about the field growing. It's about the family surviving and the family moving and the family doing what they can. And, uh, well, it's important to me now because our sons are home. Well, one of them is home right now and came home yesterday, and the other one is coming home tomorrow, and he and I are going to pick up the the that him, the older boy. Oh, I love him so much. Our younger boy drove from Colorado. He has a car. And, uh, yep, he and I are going to pick his brother up tomorrow. You know, his stories of he's a, he's a sculler on the crew team, on the varsity crew, He's a good student, and he's getting good grades, and uh, he's a math major, and uh, and uh, an art history major too, a double, and uh, but boy, he loves. He's been traveling all over the country with the team, and winning races and crew, on the varsity level, and setting records. He broke two records in these last two regattas. He did, and. It, it's really something to know that. And my other boy, well, he's in the Marines and he's a sergeant. Now, you know the old saying that sergeants win the wars, and I I think that's probably a wise saying. And uh, he's a sergeant now, and whew, he has so many good stories, good Marine stories. When he was just graduating from the MCRD uh, after, after basic training, well... Uh, we went down there. Uh, it's near near San Diego, and so moving to get there on the base. And in fact, when he and I, he was in uniform, of course. I mean, he's a Marine then; he had just graduated. And that day or the next day, the four of us went to uh, a museum on the base there. And uh, so moving to walk through there. Oh, it's maybe not the fanciest museum you ever saw, but it sure is the most important. It was to us, and he's in uniform. And and his drill instructors came up. Those are the sergeants. Those are the, well, these fellas, that's how you make Marines. These fellas make them. And uh, they were, they're not uh, old like uh, movies. They were well, both about 25 and married and had kids. And they'd been everywhere, and they'd fought everywhere. And now they were drill instructors. And they were excited to meet me and my wife. They didn't know we were in show business, by the way, because my son didn't tell them. 
and they uh, they squared off with them in the barracks. And at one point, you know, when after they met us, and they uh, said, uh, "Why didn't you tell us this? Why didn't you tell anybody your parents were this or that?" And both, you know, in show business and making these things and in these things. And uh, well, our, our kid said to him, "I didn't want to be known as Hollywood Miller, you know. I didn't want to be pigeonholed that way." And they looked at him and kind of just nodded. They got it, and he was right. And uh, that day in the museum, these two walked up, and it's funny how they they work. How all well in the service maybe, but especially Marines, they didn't say something to him like tension or anything like that. They, uh, but as soon as I saw him, I was standing right next to him, and I saw him just uh, instinctively, reflexively, and from the training, he straightened up at attention, and I saw his fingers curl a little bit at his sides and he was well not taller maybe but maybe a little taller he was at attention and uh my wife and i talked to the well the drill instructors not for long five or ten minutes and they were interested in this and that and they well, they thought it was well funny and uh, that we you told them this story or that or how this had worked out, and what what so and so was like on a movie set, and uh, and after they after they were finished, they said, "All right, well, we'll see you later," and and then they just strolled off. Also, didn't say to our kid at ease or do this. They just didn't say anything to him at all, which was interesting, and you, you felt it. And as soon as they uh, walked away. I could feel my my son just, well, went at ease and uh, just let a breath out. And my wife and I looked at him, and he was looking after the, the sergeants, the drill instructors, and just looked puzzled and just blinked a bit. And, and my wife said to him, are you okay, uh, honey? I mean, uh, did it was it annoying? Did it bother you at all that we were just chatting with the drill instructors? And he said, no, oh, no, no, that's fine. He said, I I just never seen them smile. And both my wife and I just, well, we smiled and laughed and said, you know what? I think I know what you mean. Can you imagine that, his reaction of, he hadn't seen these fellows who were good men and tough as nails and, Good family men and terrific Marines. And <laughs> I'd never seen them smile. But that's how you do it. That's how you that's how you make Marines. And oh boy, oh boy. One one night, in fact, he told us because you see, you don't talk to them on the phone. They're not allowed to make phone calls. There's no TV. There are no computers. There's no emailing. There's nothing that's intentional. They're in training. That's basic training. So there's nothing. No news. Nothing. And that's for about two months. And you're allowed to write letters, though, and they can write you letters back. There's a letter and prayer time at night before sack time. And my wife had written him that... Uh, that was when Robin Williams died. And she wrote that to him in a letter. And he, it's, it's, it's very, it's the place is silent. Nobody says anything there. That's part of the rules. And suddenly my son just, you know, just reads that and bursts out, Robin Williams is dead? Uh, he just reacted and, and burst out with that. And everybody else, what, what? And the DIs came charging over. And charge is the right word there. And they said, what do you do? You know that this is not that you're supposed to be quiet here for this and that. And uh, he said, Mama, Mom just wrote me in, in, in a letter that Robin Williams was dead. And, well, they uh, they got that. They understood it. But, he, no, you don't do that. You don't break that rule. So uh, even though they understood, he, he still had to attack the beach. That was a kind of a punishment for... Some of the some of the trainees that uh, they're close enough. It's in it's north of San Diego, and they're close enough 
well, just a few miles away from the beach. So if somebody did something wrong, well, you had to attack the beach. That meant you get dressed and you put everything on and the boots and everything, get your rifle, everything. And with the rifle held at, you know, in order arms, I think that is, out you know, about four inches from the chest at an angle, and you run and attack the beach. And you get to the beach there and attack it. And then turn around and back to the barracks, back to the base. So, and that's which, as you can guess, that's not easy. It doesn't sound easy to me. You know, that's about a, that's about a six mile run total with that rifle held out in front of you. It can't be easy to hold. But anyway, God bless him. He's a great Marine. And, uh, our youngest son is a great student, a great athlete. And he and I are going to go get Sergeant Miller tomorrow and bring him home. And then, well, we'll be a family together again, too. And my wife is going to make us all a great lunch. It'll be a little later, I guess. But who cares? And she already knows what she wants to make for lunch and what she wants to make for dinner. And... Well, God bless her. She'd be a good drill instructor, too. She loves them very much, and uh, she loves everybody here. And the doggies will give them big hugs. But, folks, that's what you really want in life, and I know it. And you and I know the same things. Homer is Homer, and Pluto is a planet. So remember, folks, as always... If you walked out of bed today and had a job to go to and a home to come back to and someone there who cares about you, folks, the game's over and you've won. And that's true for Marines and families and friends everywhere. Be well, folks, and we'll see you here next time.